Hello, I'm Peter Blackwood. Welcome to this episode of the Icon Diary. I'm writing an icon of Soren Kierkegaard. Now, any Danes of you amongst uh, hearing me say his name will be throwing things at the screen by now because I am not pronouncing the name correctly. I know, so here is a pronunciation provided by Wikipedia. Søren Åby Kierkegaard. Please forgive me as I continue to use my anglicised version of his name. Let me start by giving a short account of his life written by Christian Mostert. Chris writes, Kierkegaard was at once a devastating critic and a passionate advocate of Christianity. He was a 19th century Danish thinker who wrote many books, often with very strange titles. In his own distinctive style, and who continues to pose challenging questions to Christians today. Because of his intense focus on the individual person, he's often regarded as the father of modern existentialism. Born in 1813, he felt deeply the death of his mother, three siblings and his father within a short span of years. He felt that there was a curse on his family on account of a great sin committed by his father. He felt a misfit in the society of his day and is often called the melancholy Dane. He broke off an engagement because he would not involve his fiancée in his unusual life and on his deathbed he would not receive Holy Communion from a Lutheran pastor whom he described as the king's official. Kierkegaard was fiercely critical of the way Christianity was practiced in Denmark, where the Lutheran church was the state church. He wrote, even the cows in Denmark are Christian. He could not bear to think that people might live in the illusion of being Christian when they merely played at Christianity. What matters is actually to be a Christian. It is not a system of thought simply to be given intellectual assent. Kierkegaard attacked the very idea of explaining Christianity. He vigorously opposed the philosophical system of Hegel, both for its grand metaphysical systematizing and for offering an explanation of Christianity at a higher level. Kierkegaard's writing was a, a loud protest against this in the name of concrete existence, and this made him one of the forerunners of existentialism. Being based on the absolute paradox that God became human, Christianity is not to be explained. A person responds to it in faith and trust, staking one's whole life on it, like swimming in 20,000 fathoms of water, not by intellectualizing it and trying to prove its truth. Kierkegaard never falls, fails to challenge, even if he is sometimes shockingly overstated. His style is deeply ironic, often caustic. If he were writing today, he might have said that faith is like bungee jumping. This doesn't say everything to be said about faith, but it does identify something essential to it. So writes Chris Mostert. So what follows in this video is not a how-to tutorial on painting icons. As the name of the series suggests, it is a diary, a diary of my adventures with this ancient and sacred craft. This icon is one of over 100 icons I'm writing as a collection of the saints and heroes of faith listed by the Uniting Church in Australia for its other commemorations. So again, Welcome to this adventure. Thank you for joining me. I'm painting on a, uh, a panel, a pine panel, which is covered in many, many coats of uh, gesso. Measuring up the panel 
and just to say all of this is at four times normal speed so that we don't take too long and positioning the head and working out where the eyes will go which are halfway across the head and the nose will be a quarter of the size of the head plus a bit more for the hair he does have more uh, hair than the uh, length of a nose the eyes are a nose length apart here I'm using a B4 pencil it's a very sort of thick sketching pencil and I am sketching in pencil I don't often do this but I'm doing it on this occasion because I want to and I've got an image that I'm working from on an iPad to the side Now in the image I'm working from, in the model, uh, the figure Soren is looking sort of off stage. He's not looking at the camera as it were. And I would like this icon to look at the, at the person looking at the icon. So it'll be a case of moving the, uh, the iris and the pupil a little uh, towards uh, the center of the eye. I'm going to be working from two models. This is the main one, particularly for the face, because it gives much clearer definition of the, uh, the shading in the face, even though, of course, it is monochrome. But uh, now uh, it's time to start adding uh, some paint and I'm mixing uh, a dry pigment a yellow ochre with egg tempera and starting to put in the shading with this mixture uh, what I am discovering is that the, because of the uh, the graphite in the pencil that it kind of mixes with the paint quite well uh, and in fact sort of dissolves a bit it makes a darker uh, uh, shading which suits really well because they are the darker bits the bits of the eye so here just getting the basic shapes in place and, and thinking in terms of shading rather than in terms of, of lines It's a, uh, a, a number four squirrel brush, so it's fairly soft. Now adding a tiny bit of Mars black to the yellow and this of course will make it a bit darker. So we're going to need to be quite dark by the time we start adding more layers. Again, just thinking of the 
shadows. Now, oh, a bit more black. And what uh, Mars Black does to the yellow ochre is to make it look quite green. This part is quite time consuming, but it's a really important phase because at this point we want a, well, looking for a likeness in a, a, a figure who is, um, whose likeness is known from uh, pictures, sketches, paintings, and indeed a, um, a notable uh, a monument, a statue that I saw in 1993 in Copenhagen uh, of Søren Kierkegaard sitting on a, a, a plinth up on a on a uh, uh, a monument and uh, with a, a book on his lap. You wanted to get a bit more drastic with the dark colour and going for the, the Mars black because the clothing is very dark and so uh, that sort of greeny tinge of Mars black and yellow ochre will, won't cut it. So that's a mortar and pestle I'm using for mixing the uh, the paint and you can see the other model which has more detail in the uh, in the clothing which is a very uh, fancy flamboyant um, collar in the in that model I think my version will be a little more restrained but unlike the other model we can now see that he's wearing a waistcoat which we couldn't see in the other model This panel is actually an old panel. I painted another icon on this a number of years ago and um, I didn't like the likeness at all. In fact, the, the end result looked more like a, a former Australian Prime Minister. Uh, so I did that icon again and rubbed out and re gessoed this panel. Uh, for this icon. So a bit of recycling. Now, a bit of recycling is happening here with a, a hog hair brush with water on it sort of rubbing out some lines and a bit of uh, kitchen paper to uh, blot it up. And now we've got a bit more sort of shading in, uh, not just lines. And also we're putting in some uh, the first uh, 
layers of um, skin tone and they've been done with uh, yellow ochre and a little bit of terra vert and a little bit of um, Ercolano red. So there are about three coats that have gone on there as a, as a membrane and while I'm waiting for that to dry uh, I'm going to uh, uh, Mars black paint to really darken up the shaded areas on the clothing. I'm preparing paint for the um, the suit, the clothing, and certainly it's very dark. It's a I'm wanting it to be a, a black uh, jacket and waistcoat, uh, but I'm using a burnt umber and adding ultramarine blue, and I find this is a this makes a our uh, it's more vibrant black, if you can call black vibrant, but it's not as sort of flat and boring as Mars black. So the Mars black is, is underneath are those strong uh, lines, so that when this uh, pigment goes on, it will, you can, I can still see the um, shading underneath. I'm just adding some more coats of the um, of paint to the uh, to the face, and also adding the same mixture to the hair. At this stage, I haven't really decided on what to do with the hair, but there's a bit of correction to happen there with the with the collar. It needs to get, needed to go closer to the ear. Now that's the flesh tone mixture and I'm decanting a little bit into a palette and I will add a little bit of titanium white. So we'll start on the highlights of the face. And for this using a, a three squirrel brush. So we've got a clear view of the shading and uh, likeness underneath the membrane of, of flesh tone, the yellow ochre, Ercolano red and um, terra vert. And most of this will be covered with this uh, highlighted version, with, that is with the uh, addition of a tiny bit of uh, titanium white. Each time I load this brush, I wipe it off of 15 to 20 times on the side of the palette so that it's quite dry. These are, th these are thin layers and gives So going first to those bits of the face that stick out the most, which therefore catch the most light.
do the whites of the eyes, and so I'm mixing uh, obviously white, but to the titanium white, I'll add a tiny, tiny bit of uh, burnt, uh, raw umber green, and it just knocks the white back a bit. using a rough hog hair brush to mix this in the palette. And I'll choose a really small Kalinsky size zero brush. And now, uh, a bit of um, burnt umber for painting the iris and starting to get some delineation in the uh, in the main features of the face eyebrows eyelashes uh, probably I think we start on the um, on the iris of the eyes we want to get uh, under the nose, the bottom of the nose and the, the mouth. A bit of Mars black has gone in for the pupils of the eyes and the eye lashes. And let's give the eyebrows a bit more oomph. But we won't take the Mars black anywhere else. That's probably enough. Oh, except for under the nose. So we can see from the model, we just see the nostril. So we give that a bit of a, a bit of thickness to indicate the nostrils. This is still burnt umber rather than Mars black. And we'll go back to the whites of the eyes just to give a tiny bit of pure white just on one side of each eye, on the same side of each eye. And now, having mixed up some Ercolano red in the crease, the top of the eyelid, and in the tear ducts, down the shady side of the nose, into the lips, and really dry it off to give just a hint of blush 
to the cheeks. Left a space on the cheek for where the high wing collar goes. So now with a bit of the uh, titanium white that I've mixed for the eyes, get some collar work done. Now we need to get some highlights into the um, clothing. So I've added a little bit of titanium white to the black mixture that I'd made with the burnt umber and ultramarine blue. Hair time, and I decided to use the yellow ochre and darken it up with some burnt umber. And put in quite a few uh, layers right across the hair, but I could still see the dark lines, uh, the, uh, the, the curls that I'd put in with the, with the darker. Um, pigments 
a couple of days ago. And then added a little bit of titanium white to that mixture in order to uh, paint the highlight, get some swirls going in the hair. But using a soft squirrel brush at a number three. While I was waiting for the hair to dry, <laughs> oh, I didn't have a hair dryer, uh, I uh, put some more white into the into each shirt. So there are a few more coats on the hair. Looks quite <laughs> red there, uh, but a uh, bit of titanium white. And there's the first highlight. And here comes the second highlight with more titanium white. In the darker sections and uh, just very judiciously used some straight burnt umber to uh, get some more contrast. Um, as you can see in the model, uh, there's, it goes from quite dark to very light. I tried to get that effect as well. Well, the, the basic form is finished. We need background, halo, and inscriptions now. So I'm mixing up uh, Terra Rossa, a new pigment I've just discovered at the beginning of the year. It uh, is quite a, a, a red-brown. It's not dissimilar from red ochre. It's... It's fairly streaky, so it needed a lot of coats. And as I usually do with putting on large areas, I'm using a, a number eight uh, squirrel mop. And this I find very good, even though I wipe it off very thoroughly, it's, it goes on quite a thin coat. Uh, but you can lean on it and get quite a lot of coverage all at once. But also, it goes to 
a nice point. So you've got a lot of control for getting into the, the corners without smudging across places that you want to keep nice and clean. There we go into a corner. Yeah. It took quite a few coats before we got the end result. So now I flip it on its side and put on my uh, uh, ruler with a little hole in it, clamp it in place with the center of the uh, halo and with a pair of compasses inscribe the halo within titanium gray. and finish off with the inscription of his name. So there we have it. I hope this has been of some uh, interest, perhaps some instruction. If you like it, there's a, uh, a thumbs up symbol down below that you could uh, click on. And if you have a comment or a question, there's a spot down there too to make your comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for watching.